Will you join me in prayer? God of heaven and earth, God who knows all things and sees all things, we are reminded that scripture also calls you the man of sorrows who bears our grief and bears our pain. God, as his family and their friends celebrate and grieve and honor and remember the life of our friend, of this father and of this grandfather, we ask for your grace and peace. We ask for your blessing on the service, Lord, that we would be reminded in all that is said that it is your faithfulness and it is your goodness and your mercy that brings us to the place where we can celebrate while we grieve. We're thankful for your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Mr. Kenneth Phil Laracy, we're here today to honor and celebrate his life, uh, family. Your grief will be great and will hit you in different ways and in different times for each of you. Friends, thank you for being here to celebrate and to mourn with them and to encourage them as they do so. Kenny was born January the 15th of 1947 in Sylvania, Georgia, to the late Paul Laracy and Ida Doris Laracy. He was employed by the Southside Baptist Church for many years where he served as a maintenance uh, man as well as over the bus ministry and the children's ministry of the church there. Later he was employed by straight welding as a truck driver and then lastly up until just a few weeks ago in his last illness with the Ware County Board of Transportation and for uh, working with the school bus driving. Kenny wanted to drive a school bus, loved driving a school bus. In addition to his parents, he was preceded in death by his wife, Eleanor Mullis Laracy, a sister, Linda Kendrick, and a nephew, Scott Laracy. His daughters, Benita Moy and Cynthia Moy with Cohen Jr., as well as grandchildren, Zachary Moy with Haley, and Kirsten Moy and Jeremy Gibson, and great-grandchildren, Carly Marie Moy and the soon-to-be Cambry Eleanor Moy. Also survived by his sister, Pat Epps, a brother, Jerry Laracy, with Ann of Blackshear, Benny Laracy, uh, with his late wife, Patricia, and then Terry Laracy with Susan. A brother-in-law, Marion Mullis, with Z, and then his best friend, Rudy Hodges, and Miss Elaine. Numerous nieces, nephews, and other relatives. I, it's been my privilege to know Kenny for over 20 years. And it's been my privilege to have him here at Second Baptist with us for the last many years where he worshiped with us. And I just want to share a few things about his life, uh, show you some scriptures that remind us of God's faithfulness that Kenny exhibited for us. But Kenny had a life that was filled with love, a life that was lived in kindness, a life that he lived with friends. You heard uh, even a friend's name mentioned in his obituary. A life that was lived lightheartedly. He liked to laugh. Uh, he liked to try to provoke you to laugh. A life that was lived in service in many, many ways, but more specifically, so many times, through the avenue of churches, working with and for churches. Kenny loved his, his family, loved his late wife, Eleanor. They were, would have been married 52 years this past March 5th and their commitment to each other. Uh, Kenny's commitment, even though it had been 14 years since your mother passed away, was still uh, to his wife, Eleanor. Their marriage was a marriage marked by service, and they were some of the charter members, as many of you know, looking at this group that is here today, uh, charter members of Southside Baptist Church so many years ago. Benita and Cynthia were sharing with me the other day how Kenny would go so hard on the volleyball court that Miss Eleanor would have to remind him to let her play her spot. <laughs> I have heard one of his brother's wives say that she had to say the same thing to her husband as well. Must be a Laracy trait there. <laughs> Kenny loved his girls. He loved Bonita. He loved Cynthia. Now I will tell you, he thought one of them was just a little too bossy. I'm not going to call Benita out, so I won't say who it is, but y'all make your own assumptions there. But as I was talking to you all the other day, and then with uh, Cheryl and Wiz there as well, and then David and Judy, uh, that 
he didn't just have a love for you all. The love that your dad had for you was a love that he intended to share with everybody that came into contact with you all. And what a testimony and blessing that is. The girls said they had grew to have a strong dislike for what Kenny would call prayer meetings. And a prayer meeting would be commissioned as they were leaving church for behavior that had happened while they were at church. And so they, wanted, they knew that if Kenny said they were going to have a prayer meeting, that the only person praying would be them for deliverance. <laughs> Mickey, I won't say everything that Benita said about what you, how you influenced her and how her daddy should have been paying more attention to your behavior than her behavior. But he loved his grandchildren, Zach and Kirsten. He loved you all very much. And then Carly came along, and, and it just grew. You know, that's the beautiful thing about love. It just grows. First Corinthians says it's patient, it's kind. It just keeps going. If it's love, it just keeps going. I was told that you two could never do anything wrong. <laughs> and when they protested, specifically your mother protested, that y'all did do something wrong, he said, no, because I just let them do whatever they want to do. <laughs> Zach, your mother and your aunt were telling me of how much that you wanted to go mow with Papa and how he'd put you on the mower and ride you around until you fell asleep. And then when Kirsten came along a few years later and you weren't too keen on sharing that, <laughs> but Papa did it for her as well. Kenny's love for his grandchildren included allowing his yard to be landscaped by his grandchild, specifically through a four-wheeler, I mean a go-kart. And he'd go out there and wet the, wet the yard down so that Zach could drive his four-wheeler through there and do what he wanted with it. And then Zach would go inside and tell Miss Eleanor that he had landscaped her yard. I said that because I want to say this. Proverbs 13 and verse 22 says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Your grandfather, your father, great-grandfather, left an inheritance for you all of what love looks like lived out. Kenny didn't just live a life marked by love. He lived a life with kindness. He was gentle with people. One of the verses that came to my mind earlier this week in respect to Kenny and knowing that I would have the opportunity to stand here is out of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9 where it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Kenny wasn't a peacemaker in the sense that he stood between people and forced them to listen, but he was a peacemaker in the way he treated people. They felt respected. They felt heard. They felt listened to. The girls were telling me that he asked for the difficult bus routes. He wasn't afraid of those things. wasn't afraid to work with the difficult folks. And... For the many of you all that have seen him on the ball fields over the year, you saw this lived out as well. The peacemaker. Kenny lived a life of friendship. He loved his brothers. In the last few years, I know that he loved spending time with, with his brother Benny when they would have the time to spend. And Benny said last night there weren't too many times that they were uh, offered an, a chance to leave Huddle House before they were ready to leave. And I can just imagine the two of you all sitting in there together and what you would have been up to. But people gravitated towards Kenny because of his kindness, because of his friendship to them. There was a verse I thought of in Hebrews in chapter 10 where it says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And I thought about a life of friendship and a life that's lived in a way that provokes others to respond well in the same way. It's been my privilege to serve in churches long enough to know that folks don't just come for who's standing in the pulpit and they don't just come for who's singing and they don't just come for the things that we think they come for. A lot of times they come because of who else is sitting in the pews near them or around them. And Kenny was one of those people who helped carry out the verse that follows Hebrews 10 and 24 where it's verse 25 where it says, and let us not forsake assembly together. Kenny was a person that you wanted to see. My four-year-old son loved to come on Sunday morning. 
because he knew McKinney would get here about 8.30. We didn't start till 9.30. He'd get here about 8.30, and he'd be sitting back there in that back section, and he just knew that when he got there, he'd get to see Mr. Kenny. Kenny lived his life lightheartedly. He loved to joke. He loved to tease. In fact, when I met Kenny, first time I remember meeting him was on the volleyball court at the YMCA. I came up to the net and I looked up. Here's this fellow standing on the ladder looking down at me and he's smiling. I said, well, that's, I smiled back. And his smile got bigger. And I thought, well, that's nice. And then I looked across the court. And for those of y'all that are local to Waycross, you'll understand this. There was Higginson 1 and Higginson 2. And Kenny was smiling because he knew what I was in for. <laughs> but he lived his life lightheartedly. The girls were telling me the first time he picked up Eleanor to take her on a date that he drove Roscoe. And when she got in the car or the truck, there was a blanket on the seat. And she did not quite know what to think about that. And so she asked Kenny the purpose of the blanket. And he said, you'll see. They said, surprisingly, she went along anyways, and she got in the truck, and they got to going down the road, and she realized there were holes in the floorboard, and she needed that blanket. <laughs> now, I hesitate to say this, but Benita told me to say it. A few weeks ago, right, right prior to the last time that, that Kenny was able to attend here, he was here early, and he was sitting in the back there, and he had his phone out. Now, I know some of Kenny's, but I, I grew up Independent Baptist myself, and, and uh, I looked over there, and Kenny had solitaire on his phone <laughs> in the church house. And as many times as he's aggravated me about things, don't you believe I did not miss my opportunity to mention to him about cards and the church house and different things. <laughs> Proverbs 17 and verse 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Kenny lived a life of service. He lived a life in service. He cut grass. He drove a school bus. He worked his maintenance. The girl said he was known as the duct tape king was proud of his shirt that said that. In our community, going back many years, many of you would know him iconically for his work with Southside Baptist Church and their bus ministry. And he and Rudy, working on those buses, sometimes late into the night to have them ready to go the next morning. The girls said that sometimes they'd wake up and they would they'd look out the window and there goes Daddy and Mr. Rudy dragging one bus down the street with another, trying to get them running. I'm glad y'all did not let him work on the buses over there where y'all were. <laughs> but when I asked them for a, for a scripture that they knew that their dad would love and appreciate, the one they gave me is one that defines why he served. That's John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Kenny's service was a service to a king who sits upon a throne in heaven, but yet is so humble that he sent his son for us. And that's where his service was marked, and his life was marked by that. And I know you family will grieve much, but you can grieve well knowing that your dad's life and your grandfather's life was marked by service. We're going to hear a song now that Miss Bonita recorded for us uh, earlier this week. Uh, in reference to uh, her father. Never here to wake again, but everything was all right between his Lord. Sarah. 
But this is not goodbye. Just see you real soon. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord for the wonderful uh, things he has given us that will allow us to do what we just were blessed with. It would have been much harder for her to have stood here. It might have been humanly impossible, but thank you for the privilege to be able to worship with you even at your dad's home going today. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, ladies, for giving him so much to talk about, even though many of those things were personal. The reality of life is uh, in what Daniel has just shared with us. Yes, I thought it a little humorous when I read the obituary a few days ago I confess to you the humor in it was not that Brother Kenny had passed, but the humor in it was that his mother named him Kenneth Field Laracy. And that came to me and it sort of made me laugh, not at his name, but then his nature of being around some kind of ball almost the rest of his life. Whether it was a ball field or a ball court or whatever it might have been, Kenneth Field Laracy, 77. I read something just recently, either last night or this morning, and it was talking about the average lifespan of uh, is now like 77 years and four months in America. Well, uh, the reality of that is Kenny probably was much older than that. You say, well, the birth certificate doesn't lie. 
No, it doesn't. But in those 77 years, he crammed about 100 years of work in it. And the work was not just for pay. The work was to make a difference in the lives of other people. Yes, my Bible reading over the last few weeks as I'm reading uh, was carrying me or is carrying me through the book of 1 Samuel. And you know that book. If you do know it, you know that there's much emphasis on the character of David, Samuel, also the priest. And as I was reading that and reflecting back on Brother Kenny's life, I'm reminded there of what the Lord looks at. The Lord doesn't judge a person by our outward appearance, if you remember the text. When Samuel was put there to anoint and recognize the king who would succeed Saul, you remember Samuel wanted to take Jesse's oldest son and anoint him, and God said, no, he's not the one. Samuel would continue to look at the other guys until the Lord said, none of those. And he would say, is there another? And he said, yes, a stripling out in the field guarding the sheep. You know, Kenny Laracy was not always a, a man that you would look at outwardly. But I tell you what, when you knew his heart, you really knew him, did you not? Many young people's lives have been transformed by not only the work of a man named Kenny Laracy, but also by his heart. And his heart was larger than himself. Someone said the other day he died with a faulty heart. I said, no, his heart was good. His pump wore out. And as a result of that, if we could have the heart that Kenny had for the Lord. Yes, I was reading 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. From time to time we read the story or else hear it on television or through the internet capabilities. We read the story of someone who has taken a message at some point and put it in a bottle and sealed it tight and put it in the ocean somewhere and all they ask for is whoever finds that would give a response uh, and a location from which that bottle was received. Yes, I'm thinking about the life of Mr. Kenny Laracy. Why? Because uh, that illustrates real well him, does it not? His life placed in a bottle. Jesus uh, would remind us uh, that we are not uh, our own. Paul would say that we belong to him. We are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in our body and spirit, which is uh, the Lord. Just as sure as time continues to progress, every one of us, this earthen vessel, will die. It will cease but what's in that vessel will continue to uh, carry on God's will throughout uh, eternity. Yes, as I read that, it was very refreshing uh, for me to go back to Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 6, uh, and read again that Old Testament, some would call it an Old Testament parable. I'm not uh, moved that you call it a parable or an illustration. But there where the potter is making with the clay, forming uh, the vessel that uh, the potter would deem it to be. But the, what? the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Ever since Adam and Eve uh, were in the perfect Garden of Eden, when the first vessel got marred 
and God recreated them to a vessel for His praise and glory, we each need to understand that as long as we're in our natural state, that is the way we were born, as long as we're in that state, we'll never be all that God ordained us to be. But if we allow Him to recreate us, hard to believe that Kenny Laracy would have had any faults. Matter of fact, I didn't talk to the girls to learn a lot about Kenny Laracy. I just listened to some of his childhood buddies from Gilchrist Park area. And what they thought they were doing was telling me a lot about Kenny, but what they don't realize is he told me a lot more about them. I learned that there were a lot of marred vessels. But when all of you gave your life to Jesus, he's recreated that into vessels of honor. Brother Kenny, I'm not sure when it was that he surrendered his life to the Lordship of Jesus. But I am reminded that because he was born again, this is a celebration. Yes, there's grief, there's sorrow, but the reality of life hereafter continuing uh, is great. Uh, Gene Getz wrote a book over 20 years ago, if I remember correctly, and then he rewrote or he... uh, Uh, He gave us another version of that book, and he called it, or it's titled, The Measure of a Man. In that particular book, he gave 20 qualities uh, that uh, he would emphasize that come from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. No, I'm not here to give you the 20 qualities. But I looked that up, and I gleaned from that a little bit, and I realized... uh, That if you just type in man in the mirror, you'll find all kinds of things or the measure of a man. You'll find lots of uh, encouraging uh, things to read. However, I, I, I received a couple of quotes from that I do want to mention. Ernie Banks said, the measure of a man is in the lives he's touched. Yes. Uh, We may not always quote him, but Martin Luther King Jr. said, The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and and controversy. I would love to be able to stand and tell you today that Brother Kenny's life was one of joy and peace, and uh, all that his life, he just had it, as easy as it could be, but you and I know the rest of the story. But amazing how he stood tall through all of those things. Yes, with his wife, we hear the story. There with her cancer, dad stood tall, did he not? Other things uh, that which came about uh, that would, uh, would maybe cripple many of us. Brother Kenny used that as a springboard to accomplish what God had ordained for his life. Yes, Brother Kenny uh, will not be known possibly for his net worth, but if you knew him, you'll know he had great self-worth. Brother Kenny, as we know him, was known for three or four things that I want to give you real, real quickly. And they all come from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11.4 said, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was a righteous, or that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead, yet, yet speaketh. You realize that the Lord giving us these examples is reminding me there of Cain and Abel's worship. Brother Kenny was known for his worship, surely. I never really heard him sing. I never saw him teach. But as Brother Daniel said, uh, many years when I would come early, Brother Kenny would usually be the first one or second one here after I arrived. Why would he come so early? He came not just because he was bored at home. He came because it was the day of worship. And he would be here. There must have been a few times when, we get, when he would get out of the hospital on Thursday or Friday and be in worship on Sunday, drive the bus on Monday. Brother Kenny was known for his worship. 
like Abel and uh, there in which we see offered a more excellent sacrifice. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Enoch was known for his witness. Someone illustrated, I think it was from Bible college, someone said that Enoch and God were out walking one day, and as they walked, they got further and further away from Enoch's place, and Enoch said to God, I must get back home. And God said, no, we're closer mine than yours. You come on with me. Every day of Brother Kenny's life, not only did he live for a tomorrow, but he lived for an eternity. Hebrews eleven seven said, By faith Noah, being warned of God as things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He also was known for his work. Not just his public work, but his spiritual work. Yes, for grace, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is uh, the gift of God. Brother Kenny did not work to be saved. He worked because he was saved. Friend, what an illustration that we have in the life of a man that we celebrate today. It says in Hebrews 11, 8, By faith Abraham was called out to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. Obeyed, he went out not knowing whether he went. Yes, early the other morning, almost a week ago, Brother Kenny, he moved on out. Never to move again. Never to pack a bag again. He moved on out. Where did he go? To a place he had never been. But you know what he trusted? He didn't trust the word that some preacher gave. He trusted the word that God gave. And our Lord said to his disciples prior to his departure, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Some of you might be on your heavenly pilgrimage because Kenny Laracy believed in the gospel. Thank God for men who will share the gospel, not necessarily in bold, brash ways, but they'll share it in loving ways, ways that I call sometimes friendship evangelism. Brother Kenny was a wonderful fellow, great to get to know. I didn't pastor him 25 years, although I was privileged to be here that long. But Brother Kenny, those couple of times that he remained with us, he was faithful. And you know, that's what Hebrews 11 is about, isn't it? That is uh, faith. Faith will not lead us where God will not keep us. Girls, you have some wonderful memories. If it takes it, write it down, because one day you might be old like some of us, and you'll forget some of it. But I know Brother Kenny would not have you cease living. He would say to y'all, get up and keep going. Why? Because I watched him do the same thing in his life. God is good. What a wonderful pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to say just a few things today as we celebrate his life. dreamed I went to heaven and you were there with me we walked upon the streets of gold beside the crystal sea we heard the angels singing and someone called your name you turned and saw this young man and he was smiling as he came and he said, friend, you may not know me now. And then he said, but wait, you used to teach my children's church when I was only eight. And 
And every week you would pray a prayer before the church would start. And one day when you prayed that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart. And he said, thank you for giving to the Lord. For I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you and said, remember the time a missionary came to your church. His pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. And Jesus took that gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. And he said, thank you for giving to the Lord. For I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. so glad you gave one by one they came as far as the eyes could see each life somehow touched by your generosity little things that you had done sacrifices made unnoticed on the earth and heaven now proclaimed now i know that up in heaven you're not supposed to cry but i am almost sure there were tears in your eyes as jesus took your hand and you stood before the lord he said, my child, look around you, for great is your reward. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to glad that you gave. Yes, he, uh, he gave. And you know what? As a friend and I was talking, he keeps giving. He shared with us, and we continue to give what he gave us. And so that song encourages me to keep on. Uh, Kenny, keep on. So uh, I, I just upset about one thing. I cannot believe I didn't know Kenny's middle name. <laughs> All these years, he didn't tell me. I didn't ask. I didn't think about it. Kenny? Field, Larry. I never called him Kenneth, Coach Kenny. 
And I wanted to share something to you today. Thank you, Benita, Cynthia, and the Laracy family for asking me to share a brief word about my good friend, Brother Kenny. Brother Kenny had many names and, and many nicknames. Uh, a few of those are husband, dad, big brother, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, cousin. He's called best friend, as we've heard, by Rudy. Ref and coach. I knew him as coach, as ref, as mentor, and a friend. I'm here today to share and possibly give some more insight from the dugout about the life of Kenny Laracy as a coach, a mentor, and a friend. Back in the 90s, church softball around here had a huge league of about 30 teams. Kenny loved the opportunity to play ball with a bunch of guys after a hard day of work. As we've mentioned already, he was a very hard worker. He saw it as another opportunity to invest some time in people doing something he loved. Clint, these are some of the guys that he knew, and there's more than just my mind can remember. Clint, Terry, Jerry, Matt, Glenn, Rudy, John, and many others. He knew us all by name and jersey number. Kenny was a player coach and was gifted at balancing the two. Kenny was a big, strong man, sure-handed with the glove at first base most of the time, played hard and had a high IQ for the game. However, in my opinion, his true gift was in coaching. Kenny was so good at coaching that any one of the players at any given time would do anything he asked. If he wanted you to bat last, you would simply just do it with a great attitude. Sure thing, coach. We would run, the, uh, we would run through the backstop fence behind the home plate if he just asked us to. For those that played for him, you know what I'm saying. Oftentimes, Coach Kenny would be our third base coach. Rudy would be on first base. During most years, our team had a good mixture of older guys and younger players. During many games, Kenny would put the stop sign up for the runner to stop at third base on a hit to the outfield. This is the only time many of us, well, the younger players, didn't listen to Coach Kenny. Many of us young guys would run right through his stop sign. We wanted so hard to help our team and impress our coach. Why? Because he loved us so much. Of course, when we got thrown out at home, he would just smile and chuckle the Kenny way. He'd just throw up his hands, shake his head with that big grin. No word was needed. He didn't have to say anything. Later in the dugout, he would confront the frustrated thrown out runner with some encouraging words, a pat on the back. Later, and I think probably quite often, he would go over to Rudy Hodges and they'd say something like, now, what was that kid thinking? <laughs> they had a lot of meetings on the field. Coach Kenny was so observant of each and every player. He knew our name, he treated everyone equal, he loved us all, and he definitely didn't show any partiality or favoritism. I'm gonna read a scripture from Mark chapter 12, verse 14. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. See, Kenny was a man of integrity. He didn't look for profit or gain from others in his good works and giving of time to others. That's why it was so genuine, so real, and everlasting. Our team thrived with him as our leader, coach, and mentor. There was no secret in how he was able to manage so many teams through the years with great success 
His recipe? Take the Jesus way. There's a song the choir here is working on, and I wanted to read the first verse to you. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you because I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. If you're burdened, I'll share the weight. And if you're hopeless, then let me show you there's hope in the Jesus way. And that was Kenny, that sums up Kenny to me. Coach Kenny, he followed Jesus. Coach Kenny embraced his team with unconditional love. He was slow to anger. I never saw him burst out in anger. But then again, I didn't want to cross that line because <laughs> he was a very big man and uh, he just spoke volumes to me. He knew if a player was aggressive or passive in nature, he knew each player's weaknesses and strengths. He certainly knew everyone's physical tools on the field. While Coach Kenny was able to discern many players' physical attributes, what separated him from other coaches was his ability to listen first. He wanted to hear us so he could learn more about us and help us grow closer to Christ. James 1.19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Brother Kenny did that. He's slow to anger. Softball was an outreach to Kenny. It was an extension of the church. He showed us the proper way to handle adversity. In conversations before and after the games, he often asked us about our family relationships. He encouraged us by quoting scriptures where it applied in our lives, but it, it was never, never forced. As a player, you wanted to receive what Coach was saying because he gave first by demonstrating love, kindness, and compassion to us all. He took a lot of pressure off of us by simply being the same coach game after game. With Christ being the center of everything he did, he helped create an environment that we wanted to be a part of each time out. I kind of think he did that in his family as well, not just the team. He used laughter and equality time as medicine for our hearts and minds. He never brought stress or worries to the park. It was so important for him to protect our team's environment. He was planting seeds and having lots of fun while he was doing it. You see, Brother Kenny was not only a good brother, husband, dad, friend, and more. He was an investor, an investor in people. If Kenny could speak to us today, I think he would tell us to make wise investments. While the world might tell you to only invest in those that can help you, Kenny would say to invest in God, family, friends, and serve others expecting nothing in return. I did struggle and how to sum everything up. Uh, while this may be somewhat cheesy to others, I really can't think of a better way to say it than this. Brother Kenny, you have run the race with all you have. You've rounded third and have taken it home. Well done, my friend. Well done. May our God comfort each of you all today. God bless you.